Hi, Scott here, and I want to first thanks Timothy for the invitation to come and make what we tried to do on Sunday. But actually, we'll do a little better version here, hopefully, with a video for a little uh, food for thought on using a labyrinth and and what it might invite in your own reflections for your own life, whether you ever walk it or not. The fact that you gather here over a labyrinth at Unity, I, it's the coolest thing in my book because um, it's about both encouraging each other to be walking that inner journey of going to God and seeking divine guidance and healing whatever needs healing in your heart, but then honoring that we're all in this complex human journey that has full of twists and turns and how to respect each other's journeys when we might be in very different places, you know, on this journey. And so how to have a safe space, a sanctuary, because this sets the tone for your space, where we're holding a safe space for each other in the midst of the complexities of the human journey. And I think that's awesome that you have that here. And I'll just say, you know, Sandra McKinney, I spoke with her the other day. She'd be happy to tell you about how this Lambert came into being if you'd like to. Do you have any questions there? So anyway, background wise, you know, the labyrinth is one of the most ancient symbols in humanity. There's some petroglyphs going back to the Neolithic age in caves and their labyrinths, which is really interesting. So prehistoric, right? But so that goes back anywhere from 4,000 to some have estimated 10,000 years. Wow, you know, that's way back. Um, but then we see in early spiritual traditions like Hindu temples, Buddhist temples, Egyptian temples, um, but also Native American and, and things that you, you could even say in uh, the patterns in some mandalas and medicine wheels and all that, they do draw on this symbol, this archetypal symbol of a journey and how to walk it wisely, you might say, this human journey. And of course, the biggest piece is in a proper, healthy relationship with the divine and the creative forces of life. And so that's where the real, I think, beckoning is here and gift. So I'm going to read a little summation I wrote up as I did a little more research on the Western, most famous Western version of that, the legend of King Minos and the Minotaur. So I'll just read through that section. And then um, what we'll do is I'll make a second video that can be used for an actual guided meditation. Um, so you don't have to come back to this one, you know, it'd be in some long video. So, okay. So Minos was a son of Zeus and Europa. So the god Zeus, I mean, so we're going way back to like the golden age of man and Greek thought, uh, humanity, um, before, right, kept falling and now we're in the Iron Age, right? Um, but the idea was that people were living more in harmony with the divine at that time. And so anyway, Minos was regarded as the best of his brothers who were competing for the throne of Crete. So Minos asked for a sign of the god's favor from Poseidon in the form of a bull that he would then sacrifice back to the gods in honor of Poseidon. Poseidon gave him the bull, but then Minos was so taken by its power and beauty and so proud of his new position that he kept it for himself and sacrificed a lesser bull. Got greedy, basically. Well, long story short, the ultimate result born of his rule was the Minotaur, a monster that was half bull and half man that liked to eat people when it got the chance. And I might say that, you know, some of the earliest drawings actually show the head of a man on the body of a bull. And so the idea of kind of the intellect right, struggling with the primal energies uh, and desires of the human body, all this stuff. But then later drawings have the head of a bull and body of a man. doesn't really matter. It's an unhealthy combination 
that actually is kind of monstrous because, you know, the earliest myths say that Minos had Daedalus make a labyrinth underneath the castle, symbolic of the unconscious, a maze so confusing it worked as a prison to contain the Minotaur. So long as some people were thrown into the maze to be eaten by the Minotaur, it was satisfied to stay contained there. They couldn't satisfy its hungers. So that's why they had to create this walled maze of a prison. It's interesting. When you think about our laws and all the rules we use to try to keep people under control, you know, those more, right, uh, unhealthy desires and some of the ways they come out sometimes, well, we do it with laws in our society, and it's understandable. But the idea of, like, now a spiritual use of a labyrinth is how to go in and heal where things inside have not come into a healthy relationship. And so then you don't have those behaviors coming out that eat people, right? So, yeah, the monitor represents the monstrosities that can emerge when fear, greed, pride, and passions get the best of us. It represents where our most basic feelings, our primal desires and fears, are in conflict with the values of love. And then something unhealthy happens. The labyrinth in this story represents the ways we try to hide and contain those things or kill them. That's the, you know, the later story about Theseus going in and killing the Minotaur. Well, it's actually instructive to read the whole story because he actually, it seemed like he solved the problem, but actually he goes on to be very prideful himself and gets lost in that and has to learn the lessons of coming into a healthy relationship with his own pride. And, you know, so it's, again, killing the Minotaur doesn't solve any more than maybe a problem for a very short time, right? So the big lesson from the story is learning the right use of power and passion in service to the great power and goals of the divine, which includes what's best for us and for others and our world. And that's how we try to use the labyrinth now. You know, starting about 600, 700 years ago, Western Christianity started embracing the use of labyrinths like a shark cathedral and elsewhere. This, you know, I read one website said there's like 10,000 labyrinths throughout Christendom now. That's interesting, isn't it? But I think it's great, um, you know, that there's wisdom here if we can learn it, right? It's about going into our own hearts and our you know, our own unconscious, uh, being open to whatever we need to see to heal whatever might be unhealthy relationships between our desires, our fears, and our intellect, our critical analytical thinking, all that stuff. And that's what a labyrinth would represent. And, you know, to me, it's really about going to God prayerfully and then to our own hearts and trusting that process, you know, that's that's the key. Because God can handle us and handle anything, knows how to handle us in any situation, if we will really go sincerely to God. And that's what a labyrinth, you know, coming and doing it by yourself, or supporting others and doing it, and that we're saying, like with a worshipful space here, Hey, we support you in your the complexities of your journey. We may not all be in the same places, but we're all experiencing the twists and turns of it, right? And how to support one another with a space of compassion and encouragement to go to the love of God for both healing and then vitality and a way to go after the adventure of life that works so much better. Because as we do come into harmony within, boy, more love can come through that wellspring for ourselves and for others, you know, loving ourselves and loving others. So, yeah.